It was late on Thursday, March 21st, 1985. Beneath a canopy of trees overlooking an apartment complex behind the Red Carpet Inn Motel in Sharonville, Hamilton County, Ohio, a white 1984 Ford Escort was approached by three men, Joseph Byrne, Joe Jordan and a Hamilton County police officer. The owner of the car was 21-year-old Sherry Renee Byrne, the wife of Joseph. Sherry had parked the car much earlier that day and hadn't been heard from since. Sherry, a part-time cosmetic saleswoman, was said to be ecstatically happy when she called her husband at work that morning from their new home on Chesterdale Road in Springdale, a northern suburb of Cincinnati. She told him she was meeting with friends Kathy and David Brewer. The Brewers, she said, had just found out they were expecting their first child and were holding an impromptu celebration at the Sharonville Motel. David Brewer also had some new stereo speakers for them, she said. Excited to celebrate with the Brewers, Sherry left the house, taking her four-month-old puppy, Bo, with her. By 8pm that evening, she had not returned home. Joseph Byrne called Kathy Brewer, who informed him that she was not pregnant and that she and her husband had made no plans to meet Sherry that day. For Joseph Byrne, this was when panic really set in. Joe Jordan, who was a friend of the Burns, drove out to the Sharonville Motel, where he found Sherry's car parked behind the building. He was soon joined by Byrne and the police officer. Joseph Byrne was desperate to search the car and to open up the trunk, but he was told in no uncertain terms that if he did, he would be arrested. The night passed with no word from his wife, and as it had now been 24 hours since he had last seen her, Byrne reported her missing. When the car was examined, no unfamiliar fingerprints were found and the trunk was empty. Byrne at this point was, as he put it, a complete basket case. He was struggling to cope, but nonetheless was an immediate suspect in his wife's disappearance. According to him, he struggled for four days to convince authorities that he was not involved. Friends and family gathered that day to comfort Joseph Byrne and Myrtle Kayla, Sherry's mother. On Saturday, March 23rd, David and Kathy Brewer drove the 35 miles down from Centerville to help them print out missing posters and circulate them around southwest Ohio. Meanwhile, 45 miles northeast in the city of Beaver Creek, police had just received word of Sherry Byrne's missing persons report. It took three days, but they eventually made a solid link between Sherry Byrne and a bizarre event that had occurred in their jurisdiction the day she went missing. On the afternoon of March 21st, they had received several phone calls from concerned motorists who had all reported the same story. They had all witnessed a black car with a male driver. Out the trunk of the car, through a small gap, protruded a hand. At first, many thought it was false, but this hand was holding a piece of paper. Scrawled on that paper were the words, help me please. These reports came from South Alpha Bellbrook Road in Sugar Creek Township and Beaver Creek's Orchard Lane, Grange Hall Road, East Patterson Road and Indian Ripple Road. Several motorists had taken the registration. The car, a black 1985 Mercury Topaz, was found to have been leased to 25-year-old David Brewer of Centerville. David Brewer was summoned to the Beaver Creek Police Station that day to explain when he arrived at Beaver Creek Station, he told police that he'd had some marital problems and that day had picked up a female hitchhiker named Bambi. They had spent much of the day together smoking pot and driving around, he claimed. At one point, they decided it would be funny for her to jump into the trunk and hang a help me sign out the back. It had all been a prank, Brewer said. His story was accepted and he was charged with inducing panic and told not to play such foolish games again. It wasn't until Monday, March 25th, when, as a matter of routine, David Brewer's movements over the past few days were investigated. This is when the link was made between the misdemeanour he had received in Beaver Creek and the disappearance of Sherry. When he was brought in for questioning at 6.45pm, he assured Beaver Creek officers that he was just as worried about Sherry as everyone else. After all, he and his wife Kathy had been friends to the Burns for years, he and Joseph had both attended Georgetown College in Kentucky in the late 70s and were in the same fraternity. He lovingly referred to Joseph Byrne as his fraternity little brother. 
Brewer spent the entire evening at the police station, during which time he was joined by his wife. For hours he denied knowing what happened to Sherry and even claimed, despite the charge of inciting panic he had received days earlier, that he had never been to Beaver Creek. In fact, the story he told Detective Augustus Teague, Detective David Koenig and Lieutenant Ronald Pittman was full of inconsistencies. He began by telling them that he and Sherry had met at the hotel because she was fearful after receiving obscene phone calls from a stranger whom she believed was following her. According to this version of events, he last saw Sherry at the motel. The officers took a break from the interview at 10.47pm. This is when Brewer requested to see his wife. When Kathy Brewer was approached by Detective Teague and told that there were, quote, numerous problems with her husband's interview, she became hysterical, needed medical assistance, and was taken to a hospital. When police questioning resumed, Brewer was given breaks, plied with coffee, until eventually he began to open up. Now David Brewer's story would change dramatically as the night drew on. When Kathy Brewer returned to the police station from the hospital at 2am, she was accompanied by her father and brother. She spoke to her husband in a room separated from the rest of the group by two-way glass. The brief 15-minute conversation between David and Kathy Brewer, which ended in David confessing to his wife that he had killed Sherry, was being watched and listened to by the officers and her father and brother. Many sources claim that the conversation was also recorded without Kathy or David's knowledge, however this was later denied by the officers involved. It was 2.15am on Tuesday, March 26th, when Brewer made his final confession. As mentioned before, Brewer's questioning at the police station was plagued with half-truths and lies. Instead of covering each inconsistency and amendment, I will continue with his final confession that night, what the police already knew, and what they found out in the intervening weeks before his trial. Brewer stated that he had always been attracted to Sherry, and had vied for her affections, it worked, he said. According to Brewer, she had told him of her own marital problems, written him love letters, and on the morning of Thursday, March 21st, they had arranged to meet at the Red Carpet Inn in Sharonville. He said that they had sex during that meeting, but afterwards Sherry became remorseful and told him she was going to tell her husband. According to Brewer, in an attempt to talk her out of it, he took Sherry and her puppy for a drive. They stopped off at a park in Cincinnati where he said she became hysterical, so he told her to get into the trunk of the car, along with the puppy, to quote, calm her down. He did this before he drove on to Butler County where he bound her loosely with speaker wire. He said they then drove to Mason Warren County where he begged her to keep their secret, but she refused. He continued on to Wilmington Pike and then to US Route 35, where he stopped at the Cattlemen's Inn and made a phone call. He called the Remco Appliance Store on Linden Avenue, where he was the manager. One employee informed him that police had called from Beaver Creek regarding a traffic incident, and they wanted to speak to him. Brewer then drove to the Remco store and called Beaver Creek Police. After speaking to a Sergeant Richardson, David Brewer said he'd be at the station in an hour. He then headed northeast to Mad River Township and finally to Orchard Lane in Beaver Creek. This is when he decided to let Sherry go, he said. He then drove a short distance to the secluded farm lane of 179 Factory Road. He said that when he opened the trunk and untied her, she screamed, slapped him and started running. He said his first reaction was to grab her and calm her down, but there was a struggle. He gave chase, tackled Sherry, grabbed her by the throat and attempted to strangle her. With Sherry now unable to run, he said he walked back to the car to fetch a knife. He described this act as if he was blacked out and didn't know what he was doing. She was hitting me and I was trying to calm her down. Next thing I know is, my hands were coming away from her throat. Then I was stabbing her, he said. Brewer had killed Sherry, something he claimed he would not have done if she hadn't tried to run away. By the detective's reckoning, Sherry's murder took place between 7.30 and 8pm. Brewer said he then left her body hidden at the side of the lane and made his way to Beaver Creek Police Station to answer to the traffic incident. Showing astounding gall, David Brewer, hands and shoes still smeared with Sherry's blood, 
walked into the police station and entered a bathroom where he washed himself before being questioned. As we already know, the story of his ride with a mystery woman that ended in a practical joke was accepted, and he was released. He said he then returned to the lane off of Factory Road to retrieve Sherry's body. He stopped off again at the Remco appliance store, called his wife and told her he would be home soon. He then drove to his home in Centerville, Sherry's body still in the trunk. The next morning he put Sherry in a sleeping bag and travelled to Franklin where he had hired a storage unit. This is where he left Sherry before taking his car to be cleaned and then going to work at the Remco store. When David Brewer's confession was over, Detective Teague told him to take them to the Lane Off Factory Road and then to the storage unit in Franklin. At the Orchard Lane they found a butcher's knife smeared with blood along with bloodstains in the dirt. Master Detective magazine dated December 2003 oddly states that Teague asked Brewer if there was any chance that Sherry was still alive. According to that article, Brewer thought for a moment and said yes, there was a small chance. When they arrived at B&S self-storage on 306 Conover Drive in Franklin, it was clear that Sherry had been dead for days. She was inside the sleeping bag, the help me please note written in lipstick lay a short distance away. One of Sherry's missing flyers was hung in a window of a restaurant just 300 feet from where she lay. It's believed that David Brewer himself had put it there. Following the discovery of Sherry's body, two Springdale police officers along with a priest visited Joseph Byrne at his home. When he saw the priest, Joseph Byrne fell to the ground and said, Brewer killed her, didn't he? When Warren County pathologist Dr. Ralph Young performed the autopsy, he observed that Sherry's neck had been broken, her throat had been cut, she had 14 stab wounds, 11 of them in her chest, and there was severe bruising over much of her body. In response to Brewer's claim that the sex had been consensual, Dr. Young said Sherry's injuries all but proved otherwise. According to Dr. Young, Sherry had passed away on Thursday, March 21st, between 5 and 8 p.m., Following his arrest, David Brewer was held at the Hamilton County Jail, but then moved to Fairbourne Municipal Jail in Greene County. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity and waived his right to a trial by jury. Thinking it was his best chance of avoiding the death sentence, he opted instead for a three-judge panel. For this reason, David Brewer's trial was swift. It began on Monday, September 16, 1985. Brewer immediately withdrew his insanity plea and admitted guilt, but denied that he had planned to kill Sherry, claiming that he had only done so after she had struck him. It was a case of lust, he said, that had got out of hand. But the long line of excuses and half-truths given by the 6 foot 3, 230 pound former college football player fell on cynical ears. One of the few lifelines David Brewer had relied greatly on the opinion of psychologist Dr. Arthur Scram, who examined him. He concluded that Brewer had bipolar disorder and that his mood swings from mania to depression could affect his behaviour. He claimed that on March 21st, David Brewer was in a state of extreme mania. He was able to understand what he was doing was wrong, but was unable to control himself. However, little credence was given to the Scram report which prosecuting lawyer William Skenk described as one of the worst pieces of forensic psychiatry I have seen in 15 years as a trial lawyer. On September 18, 1985, the final day of the trial, a tearful David Brewer, Bible in hand, took to the stand for what would be almost three hours. He admitted for the first time that Sherry had not previously shown him any interest, there had been no love letters, and that he had lured her to the Sharonville Motel telling his wife that he was going to Cincinnati on business that day. However, despite forensic evidence to the contrary, he maintained that the sex had been consensual and that he had only tied Sherry up after she became hysterical and threatened to reveal their secret. He then admitted to threatening her life so that she would enter the trunk of the car, along with the puppy, whom Brewer abandoned 15 miles into the eight-hour drive, spitefully removing the dog tags as he did so. At around 4.30pm, David Brewer drove back to the Red Carpet Motel and checked out before moving Sherry's car out of the motel's parking lot and to the rear of the building. This is when he drove to the Remco Appliance Store on Linden Avenue. He was said to be in the store for about 10 minutes, 
when he came out, Sherry could be heard pounding on the inside of the trunk. During his initial interview with police, Brewer said that he went to a nearby drugstore and purchased some duct tape, which he used to bind Sherry's hands, but he denied this at trial. At some point, and unbeknownst to Brewer, Sherry had managed to pull her hands loose, reach into her purse, pull out her lipstick, and scrawl the help me please message onto an envelope. Using a tyre changing bar she had found in the trunk, Sherry then pulled away part of the trunk's rubber moulding and pushed the written message through. David Brewer was never intercepted on the road because by the time a patrol car reached the vicinity of each report, he had made a turn and driven in a new direction. When Brewer stopped at the lane of 179 Factory Road in Beaver Creek, which would be the scene of Sherry's death, it was revealed that as well as stabbing her, he had tied a necktie around her neck, breaking it as he hung her 5 foot 2, 105 pound body over his arm. When Brewer left Sherry at the Factory Road Lane to face the misdemeanour charge at Beaver Creek Police Station, an officer did take a look inside the trunk of the Mercury, but saw nothing at first glance. When the vehicle was impounded and later examined, traces of blood were found. Pathologist Dr Young, who was one of the last prosecuting witnesses, again stressed the severity of Sherry's wounds, drawing particular attention to the fact that the injuries to the pelvic area were consistent with a sexual assault. After leaving Sherry in the Franklin storage unit, which we now know he had hired on the morning of Friday the 22nd of March, from a woman named Ethelene Murphy, Brewer took his car to be cleaned, and then went to work at the Remco store. Later that day, Joseph Byrne contacted him to tell him about Sherry. Given what Sherry had told her husband before she left for the Sharonville Motel, Joseph Byrne believed that his wife had been tricked by someone who knew both him and Brewer. The next day, David and Kathy Brewer drove to the home Sherry had shared with her husband. According to Joseph Byrne, David walked in and hugged him and his mother-in-law Myrtle Kayla, and then helped them distribute the missing flyers. That night, David Brewer and Joseph Byrne sat in Brewer's car talking. David asked if he himself was a suspect, and expressed concern that his own wife might be in danger, adding that there had recently been a prowler at his house. Byrne recalled being angry at these statements and Brewer's apparent lack of concern for Sherry. After all, she was the one missing. David Brewer's family expressed their feelings during the trial. Kathy Brewer said of her husband, He's never raised a hand. I've never seen him violent. This makes it hard for me to understand what happened. Sentencing David to death would be such a waste. We've lost one life. There's been a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, and nothing's going to bring Sherry back. Before breaking down in tears, she added, I want as much of him as I can have. Myrtle Brewer, David's mother, said, This boy is full of love and compassion. He wouldn't set out to deliberately take someone's life. To take David's life for a life already taken won't make anything better. The hurt is there and will always be there. David Brewer's father, David Sr., told the judges, I can't come up with any answers as to what happened. David's not the type that would hurt anybody. He added that he believed the slaying was a result of panic and fear on David's part. Brewer's neighbours, past and present, were called upon for their opinions regarding his character. Some described him as a quiet, pleasant man. Some said he was an outgoing, friendly guy, an all-American boy. However, others described him as, quote, kind of weird, unfriendly and aggressive, even during normal conversation. Joseph Byrne throughout the trial commented on the lack of remorse shown by Brewer. The most that was ever expressed, Byrne said, was during his closing statement, when he glanced at his feet and said, I am truly sorry to the families. It took the three judges only three hours to return a verdict of guilty of aggravated murder, but first there was to be a mitigation hearing. This took place on October 16th. Brewer's lawyer, G. Jack Davis, argued that Brewer was not adequately read his rights following his arrest, he did not have an attorney present, and the recording of the conversation between him and his wife was unlawful. He said Beaver Creek Police had used trickery and illegal surveillance while obtaining a statement, the plan for Brewer's defence was to make the police station confession inadmissible as evidence, and to, at the very least, change the charge of aggravated murder to the lesser charge of murder. However, these so-called mitigating circumstances were not thought to outweigh the nature of the crime. 
They were overruled by Judge M. David Reed and the aggravated murder charge was upheld. The official sentence was handed down. Brewer was to die in the electric chair. There were loud sobs from the Brewer family when it was announced. His wife, Kathy, covered her face as the sentence was read out. His sister fainted, and after being revived, she leaned forward and yelled, You're wrong. You're all wrong. The date of execution was optimistically set for February 20th, 1986. The appeals process, however, took a long time. 18 years, in fact. The appeals made for David Brewer over the next few years relied greatly on the previously mentioned recorded conversation between David and Kathy, and the fact that he was not immediately offered an attorney. It was also noted that in 1985, Sherry's husband, Joseph Byrne, had sent a letter to Greene County authorities, telling them that if Brewer were released, he would track him down and kill him. This letter was included as part of Joseph Byrne's victim impact statement, and was reviewed by the judges before the trial began. Byrne wrote, Probation? No way. I will kill him if he ever walks a free man. Brewer's defence stated that the letter was, quote, inflammatory, and its inclusion in the impact statement prevented an impartial decision on the sentencing. Despite years of trying, all attempts to save David Brewer's life were futile, and the appeals process was eventually exhausted. One last-ditch attempt came just days before his new execution date of April 28, 2003, when his new defence team, Joseph Wilhelm and Richard Vickers, requested clemency to change the death sentence to life without parole, on the grounds that Brewer had no previous criminal record and had been a model citizen before what was described as the one biggest indiscretion of his life. He had also, it was claimed, been a model prisoner for the last 18 years. Wilhelm and Vickers wrote in the clemency application, The paradox of a diligent, kind, conscientious man who committed an uncharacteristic act of violence is a central issue here. David Brewer said, I shed my tears every day. Every morning I wake up and touch the walls to confirm I am not living a nightmare. I have a constant video and audio in my mind. If you let me live, I will have it the rest of my life. I just beg that you let me live. Joseph Byrne responded in a letter to the court. Part of it reads, For 18 years he has been desperately grasping at straws through the appellate process. This is the last straw, and I believe his pleas of mercy should fall on deaf ears, just as did Sherry's pleas more than 18 years ago. The death sentence was again upheld due to the ghastly nature of the crime, the lies Brewer had told, and the fact that he had what police determined to be between 8 and 10 hours to make the decision to let Sherry go and walk away. Green County Prosecutor William F. Skenk said the crime was so brutal and gruesome that reasonable minds could not conclude that the death penalty was inappropriate, even despite Brewer's lack of prior record. Finally, on Monday, April 28, 2003, at 10.20am, David Brewer, now 44 years old, died by lethal injection at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility in Lucasville. His last words were, I'd like to say to the system in Ohio, as far as the death row inmates are concerned, there are some that are innocent. I'm not one of them, but there are plenty that are innocent. I hope the state recognises that. That's all I have to say. Joseph Byrne was unable to return to the Springdale home he had shared with Sherry, and spent some time in the psychiatric unit of the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati. He eventually sold the home, keeping just a few mementos. He remarried, moved to Bridgewater, New Jersey in 1988, and fathered three children. Sherry's puppy Bo was eventually found in Mason, Warren County, and returned to Joseph Byrne. In 1990, during a trip back to Ohio, he went to the secluded farm lane off Factory Road, where Sherry had died. I just sat there and cried, he said. He stayed close to Myrtle and Lyle Byrne Kayla, Sherry's mother and stepfather. Their relationship did not survive the grief of losing Sherry, and they soon divorced. Speaking on David Brewer's execution, Myrtle said, It's not going to be a celebration. I don't celebrate somebody else's downfall but at the same time it means I don't have to deal with more hearings and more appeals and read about it in the paper. 
she referred to her attending the execution as walking the last mile with my daughter. Just before the execution of his wife's murderer, Joseph wrote a plea to the court for Brewer's execution. It was printed in three parts in the Xenia Daily Gazette in April of 2003. Within those lines, Joseph described his memories as Sherry, his relationship with her mother and his own guilt for bringing David Brewer into their lives. He also spoke of Brewer, a man that the press and television often refer to as his best friend, when in truth they were associates at best. The best friend tagline, Joseph said, only served to sensationalise the story. Brewer had a big ego, an ego that Byrne was sure played a massive role in Sherry's death. Going right back to his college days, Byrne wrote, David Brewer believed he could have any woman he wanted, and was rarely, if ever, turned down. The fact that Sherry had refused his advances, Byrne believed, was the reason she died. His ego just could not cope with the rejection, so he forced himself on her, and then killed her to cover it up. Byrne also points out that Brewer was only concerned with how his actions had affected his own life, and showed no remorse until the death sentence was handed down. He refers in particular to a passage from Brewer's initial statement to the police, in which Brewer describes his home life. We were on to better living, less pressure, until late March when I got into trouble. I was going to bust my ass and I did. Now it might be all gone, all down the drain, because of one day out of 26 years. Joseph Byrne also described his experience of Sherry's funeral, his suicidal thoughts, and how at two o'clock one morning, shortly after the funeral, he got into his car with the intention of driving at high speed into a ward. Instead, he drove to the cemetery, where he began shouting Sherry's name. He sat at her graveside for 20 minutes talking to her, wracked with guilt because he had introduced her to her killer. He said he became obsessed with the notion that Sherry might one day give him a sign that she was now in a better place. He looked for this sign everywhere, but it wasn't until 1986 that he felt he truly got it. He wrote that he dreamed of the most amazing sunrise, which made him feel at ease for the first time in months. As he watched the sunrise, he said the words, it's okay, it's okay, were repeated. He took this as a sign he had been waiting for. When reflecting on the pain Sherry's family had experienced in 1985 and the preceding years, Joseph Byrne said he came to realise that the death penalty decision offered no closure. On the contrary, given the extended appeal processes involved, it just prolonged the stress and pain. Joseph Byrne, over the years, also gave consideration to cases of innocent people being sentenced to death. With all this considered, he concluded that the system is broken, and in 2015, in association with a group called Ohioans to Stop Executions, he gave a speech detailing his experiences. This took place at the St. Maximilian Colby Parish in Liberty Township, Butler County, he concluded that he was not against the death penalty per se, if it was deserved, but he knew firsthand the long-term negative impact it had on families, only offering a false promise of closure and justice. His message in 2015 was, if abolishing the death penalty can help stop this, then do it. The word closure doesn't exist, he said. It doesn't happen. <laughs>